All right, time for us to get started. Get everybody seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful time that you've given us to be in your house. And we just praise your name tonight for all the wonderful things you do for us. We know that every good thing that comes in our lives comes because of you. And we pray you'll use these songs, the prayers, the message, even the announcements to lift up Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. The lion is the king of the jungle, full of power and incredible might. No other animal can match him. The Bible calls Jesus the Lion of Judah. This title comes from his royal heritage, a descendant of the tribe of Judah. Jesus was a powerful leader, a courageous savior. He is over all things. He holds all things together. He can be trusted. He is our Lion of Judah. Amen. Good to see you tonight. Let's start singing. Our hymn of worship is hymn number 148. He keeps me singing. Would you stand as we sing together, please? There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In our love, life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of His grace, Resting in the sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. I this why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing. He's be singing as I go. Soon he's coming back. Soon he's coming back to welcome me. <clears throat> Far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Feels my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. 
I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Amen. Be seated, please, Brother Mike. Okay, just a couple of reminders. Of course, we want to remind you Wednesday night, 6.30, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. I hope that you'll be here for that. And then I just want to remind you about the uh, information we're trying to collect to update our records. If you did not get a chance today to take one of the little slips out there, fill it out with the updated information, and put it in the uh, giving box out there, we would appreciate you doing that tonight. Now, if nothing has changed in your life for the last many years, don't worry about that. But if you have a new phone number, a new address, or some other information that we need to get in there, if something in your family has changed, please put it on there so we can update our records. Okay, our study tonight will be in 2 Timothy. Let's get back to our music. Oh, how I love Jesus. That's our hymn of worship, hymn number 560, okay? There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds as music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood. The sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart. Because he first loved me. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Let us do good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus 
but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Sing the chorus with me again. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for our special. The, the guys will start in just a second, but I want to read this little story for you. Some of the most moving, moving songs of praise are often birthed from times of despair. Such was the case with Shout to the Lord. While going through a difficult time and desperate for the peace of God, a Darlene Check sat down at her old piano, the same one she had had since she was five years old. She turned to Psalm 96, and without setting out to do so, she penned one of the church's most well-known hymns and praise songs in about 20 minutes. Though she'd been writing songs since her teens, she never considered herself a songwriter, and it was with trepidation that she shared the song with her church. But the response was immediate, and the song quickly traveled around the globe, giving believers new words to express their hearts to God. This was a song, again, by uh, Darlene Check from a small church in Australia. And that group and that music phenomenon uh, hit hit all over the world called Hill Songs. And since that, and that was in the early 90s, she wrote the song in 1993, and then actually birthed a movement in uh, new hymn writers and new styles of songs, which many churches sing all around the world. And I know that uh, Shout to the Lord is still sung in many, many countries and in many churches today all around the world. So uh, I'm going to sing the song for you. If you know it, we're going to all just worship together, okay? My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all oh, the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you.
my Jesus, my Savior. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Amen, Lord. We praise you for you are great and almighty. Thank you so much. Wow, that's a great song. We could uh, use that on Sunday morning sometimes, don't you think? <laughs> so everybody could hear that. Thank you very much. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly equipped to do all sorts of good deeds. Our study tonight is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15, 16, and 17, but we're going to start reading at verse 14. Let's put it on the screen up there, guys. Paul says, But continue thou in the things which you have learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. As you can tell tonight, we are going to complete chapter 3. And the subject is the church and society in the last days. Paul has listed 19 characteristics of society in the last days. Before we get into the verses for tonight, let me restate emphatically that the term last days has nothing at all to do with time. 
last days, according to Simon Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, means the last days began on the day of Pentecost. Peter makes that very clear and will continue until the end of time. Now, the end could come tonight. It could come tomorrow. It might be a thousand years or 10,000 years. The time of his appearing and the end of life as you and I know it is known only to God. So the term last days as used by Paul in this letter means these days when the gospel is being preached and the Holy Spirit is poured out upon God's people, people called Christians. The last days began with the death and resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit to live in Christians. And the key to living a victorious Christian life in these last days is taking in the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to control your life through using God's Word. In our last meeting, we ended at verse 14, and a corrected translation of that verse goes like this. Stick with the doctrines which you have learned and have been made sure of. Now I want you to stop right there. The question is, where did Timothy learn doctrine and who was his teacher? Actually, three people taught this young pastor doctrine. First of all, there was Timothy's mother and his grandmother. We don't know when Eunice and Lois accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But as you will see, Paul gives them both credit for teaching Timothy the Holy Scripture. Next, Timothy learned a lot of doctrine sitting at Paul's feet. But not only does Paul tell Timothy to stick with the doctrines you have learned, he adds another line. He says, also remember from whom you learned these things. Paul adds that line because it is important that you listen to People who teach the Word of God. He adds that because it's important for you to know who you're listening to. Timothy knew that his mother and grandmother loved the Lord. He knew they were grounded in the Word. And when he joined Paul's missionary team on the Apostle's second missionary journey, Timothy soon learned that Paul was God's Apostle. He saw Paul suffering for the Gospel's sake. And he heard Paul teach many, many different things times and many different things. He knew Paul was for real. There's a fantastic principle here, folks, and it's this. You and I make up a team, and your part on this team is to teach your family the basics after they accept the Lord Jesus Christ. You are to teach them things such as the importance of prayer, the importance of Bible study, the importance of coming to the Lord's house, being faithful in church, now, those are very basic fundamentals of Christianity, and those are not the only fundamentals. And then it is my responsibility to teach them the most complex doctrines. Doctrines such as the filling of the Holy Spirit, finding God's will in their lives, the doctrine of the blood, how to recover when sin takes you down for the count, plus many, many other important deep doctrines that we all need to learn. Now, you will have no trouble believing someone that's in your family. And you won't have any trouble believing them because you love them and you have confidence in them and you automatically trust them. But when I teach, you must check out what I teach. You must not automatically believe what you are hearing. You must check it out. You must search the scripture for yourself. You must make sure that I'm teaching and preaching what is the truth and what is God's word. So tonight we resume at verse 15 where Paul says, From childhood you have known the Holy Scripture. Now you will note the word childhood. There are several, actually there are four Greek words that can be translated child. And I'm going to give you these words and these are not written in concrete. There's a little bit of flexibility here. But basically what I'm going to share with you is what they mean. The first word is a Greek word, paideia. Now, paideia is a word that means a child up to about 12 years old. Another word is the word technon. Now, the word technon means a child that is over 12. He's not grown yet, but he is over 12. And then there is the word nephos, or nephios, really, 
And nephios means a child that cannot talk. They cannot speak. They're not a baby anymore, but they can't speak yet. They can't talk yet. And then there is another word. It is the word brephos. And brephos means a little baby. Now those are the four words, and you never know which word is being used because they're all translated by the English word child. Now the word Paul uses here is this word right here, the word brephos. Literally, he says, from the time you were a baby, you have known the Holy Scripture. Now some translators in the past have scoffed at the idea of a baby being taught the Scriptures. Actually, researchers are finding that babies do learn, and they learn very, very quickly. How do they learn? They mimic what they see, they mimic what they hear, they mimic what they experience. For example, when a baby cries, it's an outlet which results because he is hungry. A baby very soon associates his crying with the arrival of milk. And so as soon as he is hungry, he will not wait for the hungry pains to take over. He learns that the sooner he cries, the sooner the milk will come. And interestingly enough, he also learns something else. He learns that the louder he cries, the sooner the milk will arrive. And we all know that's true. Babies can learn to swim. Did you know this? Babies can learn to swim before they can speak or before they can ever talk. And researchers tell us that reading to a baby stimulates his brain. Also, we know today that babies learn at an amazing speed. Evidently, Eunice read the Holy Scriptures to Timothy while he was a baby. Today, mothers are actually encouraged to take a book and read to their little babies. And also, researchers say that a mother should sing to her baby. And she should speak to him as if she is a com in a conversation with that baby. And they say that is something that takes place, a learning that takes place in the mind and brain of a baby. And mothers and fathers both should do that. Now for Timothy, the Holy Scriptures would consist of the Psalms. It would be the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, also known as the books of Moses. There would be the prophets, of course, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the other prophets. And then there would be other books also. Now remember, if in 50 AD, when Paul and Timothy met for the first time, if Timothy was 15 then, which is probably a good guess, then as Paul writes this, he would have been, uh, he would be older, much older. He would probably be around maybe... Uh, 35 years old by this time. None of the New Testament books had been written. So Paul reminds Timothy of the time his mother and his grandmother taught him the Old Testament scriptures. He says, remember, from your childhood, when you were a baby, you have been taught the Old Testament scriptures and you know them. And then the apostle adds this. He says, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. And by which he means the scriptures, of course. He says the scriptures are able to make you wise. Now the word translated wise here is this word, sophos. Our word sophomore comes from this word. And it means the ability to learn or the ability to understand. Now you might be, not be able to compute integrated calculus. You might not be able to explain Einstein's theory of relativity... You might not be able to work out chemistry problems, but you will learn divine perspective from reading the Holy Scriptures. And divine perspective is the way God views things such as life and death and happiness and prosperity. And from the Holy Scriptures, you will be able to learn how God views those things. But the most important thing that you will ever learn is how to be saved. Once you understand how to accept Jesus Christ, there are many other things you can learn, but you have to start with that. Paul calls this experience salvation. Now, folks, in every area of life, there are many things that you can learn. But there are a few things that you must learn if you are going to be successful at whatever you are doing. And that's true in every area of life. 
For example, that's true on your job. Much of the time when I worked in law enforcement, I was a traffic unit and I was given a special car. It didn't have any lights on top. It didn't have Bel Air police on the back. It just had two emblems on the side as the law required. And during my 25 years, I was in probably a hundred high-speed chases or pursuits like you see on cops. I didn't start them all, but I was in probably a hundred of those because I always had the fastest car. I had a pursuit car. Only one of those cars that I chased ever got away from me, and that was the very first chase I was in. And I remember that night so well because I got behind this speeder and uh, I had a lot of things I had to do. I had to turn my red lights on. I had to reach over and grab my microphone. And by the time I did all that, when my red lights went on, he took off like a shot. And I hadn't even got my microphone up to my face yet. And before I knew it, he was gone. Well, I learned a lot from that. I learned, first of all, you don't turn your red lights on until you, call to, until you put the license plate out. You make sure you know exactly where you are so you can put that out on the radio if they do run from you. But I learned something else. I learned that I didn't really know how to drive as I needed to. And I learned that if I was going to work as a traffic unit, I needed to learn everything I could about how to drive. I thought I knew how to drive. But I looked up every police driving course that I could find and asked the department if they would send me to those places, and they did. And after some times, I learned that in a chase, if I did everything right, nobody could get away from me. Sometimes I had to chase them all the way to Galveston. Once I chased a guy all the way to Hempstead. Once I chased somebody to Sugar Land back through downtown Houston, and it ended in Pasadena. But after that, after I learned to drive, no one got away from me after that. Now, there are many other things I learned as a traffic unit but driving was number one. Whenever someone becomes interested in spiritual things, the most important things, that, the thing they have to learn is salvation. How to become God's child. Paul calls it being wise unto salvation. Now, obviously, without the Holy Scriptures, nobody can ever find God. The stars and the clouds and the comets and the vegetation may alert a person that there is a creator, but those things will not tell a man or a woman how to find God, how to have the Lord as their Savior. Many men and women are looking for signs and wonders and visions and miracles, but Jesus said in Matthew 16, 4, It is a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah, and as he left them, he then departed. Now, I want to add another note here. Don't ever get involved in a debate about the Bible or Christ with unbelievers. Don't ever do that. Remember, the devil will sidetrack you any way that he can. And a good old-fashioned debate about the Bible or Jesus is just the way he can get you sidetracked. Remember in Acts chapter 17 when Paul was in Athens... He got into a debate there with the Greek scholars. And they debated back and forth. Paul was a great debater and he won the debate. But he never won a single person of Christ as far as we know in Athens. Just share the information about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let God produce the results. But don't ever get into an argument with an unbeliever about the Bible or about Jesus. Just present the gospel and let the Holy Spirit take over. So remember, like my learning to drive was the primary skill I needed in pursuits, you must learn to share the Lord Jesus Christ. And to do that, you must know how salvation comes into the life of a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. Now here in 2 Timothy, Paul reminds his young friend that salvation comes through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And the word faith is our familiar friend, pistos. It is translated sometimes as a verb, and in verb form it means to believe, to trust, to have confidence in. In noun form, it is always translated by the English word faith. That is exactly what Paul wrote to the Christians at Ephesus when Timothy was the pastor there. In, second, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul wrote, For by grace are you saved through faith, through pistis. 
and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So as Paul writes to his young protege, he knows in all probability that this is his last letter. And what is it that Paul thinks is so important that he puts it in this letter? The answer is he wants Timothy to know the importance of the Holy Scriptures. The Scriptures his mother taught him, the Scriptures his grandmother taught him, and the Scriptures that Paul taught him. Paul tells Timothy, knowledge of the Scripture will make you wise. And then we have verses 16 and 17 that I quote before every Bible study. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for all good work. Now let's stop right here and take up the doctrine of biblical inspiration because you need to understand this. First of all, let me give you a definition of biblical inspiration. Inspiration. The word inspiration is a translation of a Greek word, and it is this word right here, theonoustos. Now that is called a compound in Greek. Theo means God, and noustos means to breathe. So, Theonoustos means God breathed. The apostle tells Timothy and you and me that all scripture is God breathed. That means God is the source of our doctrines. Now, as we come to point number two, I want to ask you a question. What does Paul mean when he uses these two words, God breathed? What does that mean? Well, there's all sorts of ideas. For example, some say the Bible is inspired, but it is not infallible. That's what some people say. That's what some Baptists say. It is inspired by God, but it is not infallible. Today, there is a splinter group that is broken away from Southern Baptists. They are called the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. They have 1,800 churches, by the way. Some of my friends from Baylor are involved in this new denomination that has been going on now for a number of years. One of those is a young man who was at one time a very good friend of mine. His name was Daniel Vestal. His father was a very good friend of mine. He was a very good friend. He became the executive coordinator of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, which means the buck stopped at his desk. Daniel roomed across the hall from me at Baylor in Brooks Hall. He conducted a revival for me after he got out of college and I was out of college. And once he was grounded in the faith, he came from one of the strongest Christian families that he could come to. But as far as I can tell, he's not grounded anymore. If any of you ever wonder what the breakup was about, let me read to you from the website of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Under this, what does the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship believe about the Bible? This is their paragraph. This is their paragraph. We want to be biblical, especially in our view of the Bible. That means we dare not claim less for the Bible than the Bible claims for itself. The Bible neither claims nor reveals inerrancy as a Christian teaching. Bible claims must be based on the Bible, not on human interpretation of the Bible. Now that may sound good. But what they're saying is, the Bible is not an infallible book. What you read in the Scripture is not God-breathed. Some of it may be, but some of it may not be. And you just have to decide for yourself what is God-breathed and what is not God-breathed. Now, folks, how any Christian can say, just because it is God-breathed doesn't mean the Bible is without errors, that amazes me. Infallible is the very definition of God-breathed. God breathe means that God is the one who says it, and if God is the one who breathes it, it cannot be fallible. Now, if the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship is correct, then you and I can never know for certain what parts of the Bible can be trusted. If the Bible is full of errors or has errors, even one error, then it may be that Jesus was not born of a virgin. It may be that Jesus did not do miracles. It may be that Jesus did not die on the cross. It may be that Jesus was not raised from the dead. 
If any part of the Bible is an error, then we can never trust what it says. We can never trust any part of it. In that case, Jesus could have been an imposter. Now, some people say that it is not infallible. It just means it was inspired, like you get inspired at a football game. And then some people say this means it was dictated. That every word the writers like Paul wrote down were words that they heard and they wrote down. They were the stenographers and they just wrote down what they heard. Now this cannot be true as I will show you in a moment. And then there are others who say that God breathed means that God moved upon the writers and they wrote as the Holy Spirit led them. However, God allowed these writers to use their own style. He allowed them to use their own grammar, their own vocabulary. That's why you can read John's writings or Paul's writings or Peter's writings in the Greek. And even a first-year Greek student can tell you that different authors, three different authors, wrote those books. In Philippians 2.5, Paul tells his readers that the scriptures are what God thinks in black and white. All right, point number three. Paul says all scriptures are profitable. Profitable is a good translation. I like that. The word opheleo means to profit, to be good for something. So the question is, what is the God-breathed scriptures good for? Well, Paul lists four things the scriptures are good for. First of all, he says doctrine. The scriptures are good for doctrine. It means the teaching of doctrine, like I'm trying to do tonight. Without the scriptures, I could give you my opinion. But frankly, what I think is not really important. What God thinks is very important. Everything we believe comes from the Bible, folks. Every doctrine we believe comes from the scriptures, not from what I say or do or you say or do or some theologian says or do. Secondly, he says they are used for reproof. The word reproof here means to convict, to rebuke, to gently criticize. I like that word, rebuke, gently criticize. And then thirdly, for correction. The Greek word correction comes from a word that we will all recognize. It's the word orthos. Uh, Let me start over here. O-R-T-H-O-S. Our word orthodontics comes from this Greek word. It means to straighten. So the scriptures are good to straighten us out, to straighten us up. Again, in my own life, I found Paul's words to be very, very true. The scriptures straighten me up. My nature is when someone says something to me that is mean and hateful, My nature is to strike back at them. That's my nature. But because I know the Holy Scriptures, they set me straight. And they make sure that I don't react that way. When people are mean to me, I try not to be mean back. Because that's the way the Lord deals with me. When I'm mean to Him, He's good to me. And so when people are mean to me, I'm supposed to be good to them. The Scriptures straighten us up. I like that too. Now, there's something else that we are told. They're good for righteousness, to teach us righteousness. When you want to live for Christ, but you don't know how, that is when the God-breathed Word comes in so wonderfully. Because that's what you turn to, to learn what you need to know. The God-breathed Word helps us judge ourselves. To evaluate our own lives and our testimonies. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. You know what he means? He means that if we would evaluate our own lives daily and straighten out our own lives daily and confess our sins daily, then God wouldn't have to discipline us as His children. Let me issue a closing warning tonight. If you are living a rotten Christian life, like many people do, 
and you fail to judge or discipline yourself, then at the appropriate time, God will do the disciplining. God will do the judging. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, somehow I get the idea that it would be better for me to discipline myself and judge myself rather than to wait on God to discipline me and judge me as one of His children. Now one day when someone else stands in this pulpit or any time anybody stands in this pulpit and teaches the Word, we must always make sure of one thing. We must make sure that that person is a God-called man who believes that the Word of God is God-breathed. It is God-breathed Word that we study and that we use when we walk out those doors. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll pick up there next time. We have only about four sessions left in 2 Timothy. As we go to the Lord in prayer tonight, I'm going to ask a special prayer request for Don Beard, one of the teachers in our school. Don uh, fell and hit her head and has a concussion. She's in, the, in rehab right now. She was in the hospital. She's in rehab. And uh, be praying for her. I saw her yesterday at the hospital. So let's be praying for Don Beard. She has a great burden. She has children at home and... Uh, she is doing a great work for them and a great work for our school. So let's, let's remember her in prayer. So let's go now to the Lord in prayer. Jimmy Cash, would you lead us in our closing prayer, sir?